So I have to come clean and tell the world. And I gotta come clean that I killed those seven men in first degree murder and robbery. Over the years, the unthinkable crimes perpetrated by male serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy have dominated the news to the point that it's almost easy to forget that women are also capable of committing crimes gory enough to stop the world in its tracks. One of these women was Eileen Carol Wuornos, aka the Damsel of Death, who is often credited with being America's very first female serial killer. While many believe that Eileen was the devil herself who had materialized to haunt Florida's highways, others believe that she was a damsel woman who ventured down a deadly path after being dealt a bad hand in life. In today's video, I'll be doing a deep dive into the troubled life of Eileen Carol Wuornos. The Making of a Monster Eileen was born Eileen Carol Pittman on February 29, 1956, in Rochester, Michigan, to her mother Diane Wuornos and her father Leo Dale Pittman. Ironically, Eileen had already been dealt a bad hand before she was even born. Eileen's mother, Diane Wuornos, met and married her father, Leo Dale Pittman, when she was just 14 years old, and he was just 18. According to some accounts, Diane's parents, Lori and Britta Wuornos, did not approve of her union with Leo, so she eloped with him. A year after the two teenagers tied the knot, Diane birthed their first child, Eileen's older brother Keith, on March 14, 1955. While there are no details about Leo and Diane's marriage, it's safe to say it wasn't pleasant, because the following year, two months before Eileen was born, Diane filed for divorce. Shortly after Eileen was born, her father was diagnosed with schizophrenia and was incarcerated for kidnapping and assaulting a seven-year-old girl. A few years into his sentence, Leo took his own life, sealing his daughter's fate completely, even though they had never met. After Diane filed Filed for a divorce, she moved back in with her parents and siblings in Troy, taking her children Keith and Eileen with her. Since Keith and Eileen were extremely young, they quickly adopted the mindset that Diane was their older sister, while Britta and Lori were their biological parents, and no one thought it wise to correct this notion, especially because a few years down the line, Diane took off. In January of 1960, Diane up and left, abandoning her children with their grandparents. At the time, Eileen was around four years old, and her brother was almost five. Two months after their mother abandoned them, Eileen's grandparents went ahead to legally adopt her and Keith. Now the household was officially made up of Lori, the grandfather, and Britta, the grandmother, their own biological kids, Barry and Lori, and Eileen and Keith. While this would ordinarily be a thing of joy, since Britta adored Eileen, it turned out to be the start of one of the worst periods of Eileen's life, one that played a significant role in shaping her to be a killer that shocked the world. For starters, both Laura and Britta were hopeless alcoholics, with next to no plans of recovering, as if the alcoholism wasn't bad enough. Enough, Laurie was also said to be very strict, and more often than not, his strictness veered towards abuse. He would beat the children with belts and straps every other day, and since Eileen had a rebellious streak, she was often on the receiving end of these beatings. According to several reports, there were times when Laurie would beat Eileen in a pseudo-sexual manner by making her strip out of her clothes first. Eileen herself claimed that Laurie did go on to assault her. When he wasn't shelling out his beatings, Laurie would settle for psychological torture. On several occasions, he called Eileen degrading names, and one time he made her watch him drown her kitten. Laurie's daughter, Laurie, also confirmed that her father used to take away Christmas presents sent by Diane to her children. As time passed, Eileen grew into a beautiful but troubled young girl with what many called an explosive temper. Others perceived her to be a wild child who was always up to no good. At school, Eileen was relatively quiet, and she kept to herself, since she didn't have the best reputation. The other kids decided to keep their distance from her as well. No one wanted to play with her when she was was little, I could, I always felt sorry for her. Since young, Eileen didn't have many friends. She had no choice but to find solace in her brother Keith. On the surface, the two appeared to be thick as thieves, which is normal for siblings. But what many didn't know at the time was something darker lurking underneath. Eileen and Keith were involved in an incestuous relationship. At the time, I didn't really know it was wrong, what they were doing, you know? And yeah, they had sex. When Eileen was around 10 years old, she began engaging in sexual activities with her brother. And while it is unclear what the motivation behind this unusual dynamic was, it has been confirmed time and time again that these acts were somewhat consensual. Despite her temperament and her inner struggles, a part of Eileen desperately wanted to belong. So she wanted to fit in with the other kids. So whenever she could, she would sneak out to join their nightly hangouts at a place called The Pit. At first, Eileen wasn't accepted into these gatherings, but soon she found a 
the way in, sex. Despite being only 10 years old, Eileen had already formed an opinion about sex. She saw it as a means to an end, so she probably didn't think much of it when she began to engage in sexual activities with the boys in the neighborhood in exchange for cigarettes and loose change, all the while basking in whatever attention she received from them. With the money she was paid, Eileen would buy beer and drugs, and she'd spend whatever was left trying to buy friends. Unfortunately for young Eileen, her attempts to win over people by spending money on them didn't pay off. Instead, she got thrown out of her own parties, despite having provided all the party supplies and looked down on for her decision to sell herself. She even earned the name Cigarette Pig, or Sig Pig for short, a nod to one of her preferred payment methods. As the years rolled by, Eileen's situation continued to deteriorate. She discovered that Laurie and Britta were not her biological parents. The beatings at home became more constant. She was performing poorly at school, and the neighboring kids still wanted nothing to do with her, all except Dawn Botkins. Dawn stood by Eileen's side and tried to stand up for her whenever she could. Unfortunately, even Dawn's friendship couldn't protect Eileen from what was to come. When Eileen was only 14 years old, she fell pregnant after being assaulted by a man she claimed was a friend of her grandfather. When it was almost time to have the baby, Eileen was sent to a home for unwed mothers, and finally, on March 23, 1971, she gave birth to her son. Unfortunately for the mother and son duo, they were separated at birth. The baby immediately put up for adoption, and Eileen went back to her grandparents. Some sources even claim that Eileen never got to hold her child. When Eileen returned home, she quickly fell into her old ways, but there had been a shift in her ideology. According to Laurie Wernos Grody, the biological daughter of Britta and Laurie, who grew up with her, Eileen began to say things like, all men are out to use women, and this mindset would eventually lead her to becoming America's first female serial killer. Months after the birth of Eileen's son, life dealt her yet another cruel blow. Her grandmother, who she regarded as the one person who truly loved and cared about her, passed away from an illness some sources have identified as liver failure. The going gets tougher. There are various accounts of what happened following the passing of Britta Wuornos. Some accounts claim that around this time, Eileen had cultivated the habit of running away to attend parties, so when she returned from one of such trips to attend Britta's funeral, she was busted as a runaway and sent to Adrian's reform school for girls before she escaped. Other accounts claim that Laurie Wuornos kicked Eileen and Keith out following his wife's death, causing them to become wards of the state. With nowhere else to go, Eileen sought shelter in the woods near her grandfather's home, and sometimes she would sleep in abandoned cars. When she needed to clean up, she would visit local gas stations. Despite the fact that her life had taken an impossible turn for the worst, Eileen managed to remain in school, but she soon fell in with the wrong crowd. Hanging out with the wrong crowd meant it was only a matter of time before she fell knee-deep into drug and alcohol addiction. In her freshman year, when she was around 15, Eileen was caught with drugs and was summoned to the principal's office. Instead of making excuses or facing the consequences of her actions, she decided it was time to throw in the towel. So, she quit school and never looked back. Now, free from the last institution, that bound her to Troy, Aline began to live a nomadic lifestyle, selling sex and hitchhiking from one state to the next. But I remember she would tell Dawn and I, oh, I gotta go, you know, and she'd go off hitchhiking, well, well, by herself, or whatever. You know, she would just take off and go. In every location she visited, she made a living by selling sex and sometimes drugs. When sex couldn't pay the bills, Eileen would take to truancy, petty theft, and shoplifting. For roughly two years, Eileen, who had begun to go by the name Lee, continued to live like this. But it was only a matter of time before she had her first run-in with the law as an adult, the petty crime spree. On May 27, 1974, just a few months after she turned 18, Eileen was arrested in Jefferson County, Colorado. Her crimes were driving under the influence, disorderly conduct, and firing a .22 caliber pistol from a moving vehicle. While there are no official records, it's safe to assume that Eileen spent the next two years adding a few more petty crimes to her rap sheet before she decided to hitchhike to Florida in 1976. The decision to move to Florida at the age of 20 wasn't out of character for Eileen. She always preferred the carefree lifestyle, and where better to live than in the golden beaches of the Sunshine State. In Florida, Wuornos met 69-year-old Yacht Club president Louis Gratz Fell, and the pair seemed to get along. In fact, they got along so well that they tied the knot shortly after meeting. Since Fell was a wealthy businessman, he had all it took to be Eileen's ticket out of poverty, hardship, and sex work. Unfortunately, his was a love that did not last. For starters, they had very different lives and interests. While Fell spent his time with his yacht club friends, Wernos was busy visiting the local bars and getting into bar brawls. It is alleged that one of these brawls earned her a jail term on charges of assault. Thanks to Eileen's actions, Fell's reputation took a bit of a hit, and after one too many trips to bail her out, he began to grow 
tired of her and the union. The straw that broke the camel's back, or in this case, Eileen's marriage, was when she allegedly beat Fell, her aged husband, with his own cane. After the incident, Fell decided he had had enough, so he ended things and got a restraining order. Just like that, Eileen's marriage of convenience had come crashing down in a matter of weeks. After the failed marriage, Eileen returned to Michigan, and it didn't take long for her to get on the wrong side of the law there. In July 1976, she was arrested at Bernie's Club by local authorities for assault and disturbing the peace. While Eileen lived her life hitchhiking from place to place, her brother Keith had fallen gravely ill. Finally, on July 17th, 1976, Keith succumbed to esophageal cancer. Following Keith's death, Eileen received $10,000 from his life insurance. Another opportunity had presented itself for Wernos to reinvent her life, but perhaps she was too far gone at this point. Eileen eventually squandered the money she received from Keith's life insurance on luxuries, including a car, and she spent what was left of it paying off fines for several other offenses. When the money ran out, Eileen returned to the only life she knew, this time determined to hit bigger targets. As the years rolled by, what started out as a life of petty crime gradually evolved into armed robbery, car and firearm theft, resisting arrest, forgery, obstruction of justice, and identity theft. In later interviews, Eileen would try to exonerate herself, saying she never meant to commit some of the crimes she was charged with in her 20s. Speaking on the armed robbery charges, she claimed that she had no intention of robbing the store. According to her, she had indeed entered the store with a handgun because she was drunk and heartbroken at the time, but she didn't try to rob it. The sight of the gun had frightened the shopkeeper so much that she had called the police. On the forgery charges, Eileen claimed that she had been working for a man who withheld her wages for quite some time, and so she decided to take matters into her own hands and forge her paychecks. Whatever her motivations were, the truth remains that before she turned 30, Eileen had racked up quite the criminal record. As a result of her extended rap sheet, Eileen was no stranger to the insides of a prison cell. She had been in and out of jail on several accounts, but what she and the rest of the world didn't know was that the worst was yet to come meeting Tyria. In 1986, roughly a decade after her failed marriage with Louis Gratz fell, Eileen met Tyria Jolene Moore at a bar called Zodiac. At the time of their meeting, Wuornos was a 30-year-old career criminal, while Tyria was a hotel maid who had left her conservative hometown of Cadiz, Ohio, to fully embrace her sexuality. Despite having spent more than a decade of her life selling her body to men, Eileen fell head over heels with Tyria, and in no time, they had become a couple. The two women moved in together shortly after they met, and Eileen, who up until that point was accustomed to paying for love, was determined to take care of Tyria. Since the only way she knew how to earn money was through sex work, she continued in that line of work, even though Tyria frowned at it. Whenever they were together, Eileen and Tyria would spend their time drinking beer and watching TV. On occasion, they would venture into the woods to engage in one of Eileen's darker interests, firing handguns. Around the time that Eileen turned from petty theft to armed robbery, she developed an attachment to handguns and would carry one wherever she went. Initially, she claimed that the firearms were a protective measure, but it was only a matter of time before it proved to be so much more. As their relationship progressed, Eileen grew older. She was now in her 30s and was no longer as attractive as she used to be. This, of course, made earning a living as a sex worker increasingly difficult. While others may have taken this as a sign to secure a job or even start a side hustle, Eileen decided to venture down a more sinister path. The beginning of the end. Everybody has that breaking point, and I think that she finally just snapped. On November 30th, 1989, Eileen went to work knowing that she and Tyria were $1,200 behind on rent payments and that she had to do something about it. She probably still had this thought in her mind when she encountered 51-year-old Richard Mallory. Richard had a violent history of rape and abuse, and when he approached Wernos hoping to purchase sexual services, she had no idea who he was. Richard, on the other hand, had no idea that in his pursuit of momentary pleasure, he would lose something far more valuable, his life. After working out the terms of their arrangement, Richard and Eileen headed to a secluded area to carry out the transaction, but things didn't go as planned. Somewhere along the line, Eileen pulled out the .22 of a handgun she had grown accustomed to carrying in her purse and shot Mallory a total of three times. One of the bullets hit his left lung, killing him almost instantly. After killing Mallory, Aileen proceeded to rob him, taking everything valuable she could find. She then covered his body with a piece of carpet and fled the scene in his Cadillac, leaving her first victim behind. Two days after the incident, a Volusia County deputy sheriff discovered Mallory's abandoned vehicle, but it would take six weeks for the authorities to discover the abandoned body of Richard Mallory. When Aileen returned home with Richard Mallory's possessions, she allegedly told Tyria that she had killed him in self-defense, but it wouldn't be the last time she returned home with items that belonged to clients who had met their unfortunate demise at her hands. According to authorities, Eileen's next victim was 47-year-old David Andrew Spears, an unsuspecting construction worker in Winter Garden. The pair met on May 19, 1990, roughly six months after her first taste of murder. Like Mallory, Spears had approached Eileen, hoping to exchange money for sexual services, but things didn't go the way he hoped. On June 1st, 
1990, the naked, decomposing body of Spears was found along US Route 19 in Florida in Citrus County. His cause of death was identified as six bullets fired by a .22 pistol. The Era of the Damsel of Death After getting away with the murder of both Mallory and Spears, Eileen began to grow more confident. She began to kill more frequently, and her killing methods became more brutal. On May 31, 1990, barely two weeks after she killed Spears, Eileen struck again. This time, her victim was 40-year-old Charles Edmund Coscadden, a part-time rodeo worker. After luring Coscadden to a secluded area in Pasco County with the promise of paid sex, Eileen pulled out her gun and shot him a total of nine times. Afterward, she pulled his body out, wrapped it in an electric blanket, and dumped it before making away with his car and valuables. By the time Eileen encountered her fourth victim, Peter Abraham Seams, in June 1990, she had already obtained serial killer status. Seams was a 65-year-old retired merchant seaman who left Jupiter, Florida for Arkansas but never made it there. His car was found abandoned in Orange Springs, Florida, but his body was never found. After the murder of victim number four, Eileen had perfected her modus operandi. She had also determined that she had a type. From the beginning, did you know that you were going to kill them when they picked you up in their cars? I pretty much, <clears throat> I pretty much had them so, uh, selected that they were going to die. Eileen's preferred victims were middle-aged men, and so when she spotted 50-year-old Troy Eugene Burris, a sausage salesman from Ocala, Florida, she immediately selected him as her fifth victim. Burgess met Eileen on the 31st of July, 1990, and four days later, on August 4th, his remains were found in a wooded area along State Road 19 in Marion County. At around this time, the authorities were starting to get frantic. The world had previously been introduced to the concept of serial killers, and with each new body that was discovered, it became more and more apparent that they had a serial killer on their hands, but never in a million years did they think it would turn out to be a woman, not at first anyway. Before her luck ran out, Eileen managed to kill and rob two more men, one of which was 56-year-old Charles Richard Dick Humphreys, a retired U.S. Air Force major, former state child abuse investigator, and former chief of police. Humphreys' body was found in Marion County on September 12, 1990. His cause of death was seven shots to his head and torso. Eileen's seventh and final victim was 62-year-old Walter Gino Antonio, who was a trucker, security guard, and reserve police officer. After his deadly encounter with the damsel of death, Antonio's naked body was discovered near a remote logging road in Dixie County with four fatal bullet wounds. Some accounts claim that Eileen struck one more time after she murdered Antonio. However, there are no facts to support these claims. To this day, there are rumors about an unidentified eighth victim. The end of an era. As Eileen went on her killing spree, leaving a trail of dead bodies behind her, what she didn't know was that she was ultimately leaving behind a trail of leads that all pointed to her. The first major breakthrough the police had in their investigation was when they found the vehicle of Peter Seams, Eileen's seventh victim. Prior to the discovery of the vehicle, eyewitnesses claimed that they saw Wernos and her lover Tyria abandoning the car after crashing it off State Road 15. One particular witness, Rhonda Bailey, said that she saw the pair exiting the vehicle and provided the police with a description of them. Rhonda said that Eileen removed the license plate with her bare hands in a desperate attempt to get rid of any discriminating evidence. But while she was a woman willing to do anything to get by, Eileen was still a hitch hiking hooker, not a seasoned killer. She had next to no knowledge of what to do to get rid of the crime scene evidence. In Peter Seams' car, Eileen's palm print was found on the interior door handle. Police also found cigarette butts with Eileen's prints on them. After killing each victim, Wernos would cart away any valuable items in sight and then proceed to pawn them off at local pawn shops. One of the items she pawned off was a gun that belonged to Coscadden, her third victim. Thanks to her regular visits, police found Wernos' fingerprints on a receipt at a pawn shop she had visited earlier. From then on, identifying her was a walk in the park. Eileen had racked up an incredibly long rap sheet in Florida, and so samples of her prints were in the database. Armed with enough evidence to bring her in, the police released a composite sketch of Eileen and Tyria statewide. According to some accounts, Tyria saw the sketch and realized that the police were onto Eileen. Not wanting to go down with the sinking ship that was her lover, Tyria left Wernos and returned to her sister's home in Pennsylvania. On January 9, 1991, roughly two months after she murdered her final victim and a few days after Tyria left her, Wernos was picked up by authorities on an outside standing warrant at the last resort biker bar in Volusia County. The police had sufficient evidence that tied Eileen to some of her victims, but they needed more, so they did something that's not out of character for law enforcement. They made a deal with who they thought was the lesser of two evils. Less than three days after Eileen was taken into custody, the police managed to track down Tyria Moore. Instead of taking her in as a suspected accomplice, the authorities offered Moore immunity from prosecution if she agreed to elicit a confession from her now estranged lover. Moore agreed to these terms and was brought back to a motel 
hotel in Florida. There, she placed numerous calls to Eileen over the course of the next three days, attempting to get her to confess. While on the phone, Tyria begged Eileen to confess, saying that the authorities were threatening to pin the murders on her. She even went as far as suggesting that she might take her own life. On January 16th, 1991, the third day after she began to have phone conversations with Tyria, Eileen gave in to the desire to protect her lover and confessed to the crimes. Just like that, Eileen's lover, the woman who had shared her life for four years, was all set to be the prosecution's star witness in her murder trial. In Eileen's videotaped confession, which ran for a total of three hours, she reiterated again and again that she was confessing to her crimes to protect Tyria, and when asked what her motive was, she said self-defense. I killed him, I didn't murder him. Murder is first degree murder in intent, and killing is something you have to do in defense. The end of the monster. In the months following her arrest, the Floridian authorities learned the hard way that America's first female serial killer often told discordant stories. Sometimes she claimed to have been the victim of rape with every man she killed. At other times, she confessed that she was trying to rob them. Depending on who was listening to her narrative, her story changed. After Eileen's arrest, Arlene Prawley, a rather odd born-again Christian who claimed that she was handpicked by God to save Eileen, reached out to her, and the two started to build a relationship, one that eventually led to Prawley legally adopting Wernos. Even though Wernos was arrested in January of 1991, she didn't go to trial until January 13th, 1992, when she was tried for the death of Richard Mallory and was represented by Trish Jenkins. During the trial, Eileen reiterated that she killed Mallory in self-defense and even went on to give a graphic account of how he raped and assaulted her during their encounter. Seeing how Mallory had served time for abuse and assault, Eileen did have a case, but in what is now considered a grave injustice against Lee's right to a fair trial, no evidence from Mallory's past was presented. In addition to what some call the incompetence of Eileen's lawyer, the prosecutor presented Tyria Moore as their witness. Tyria took the stand, gave an extensive account of their relationship, and refuted Eileen's self-defense claims, saying that she did not return home with injuries on the night of the murder. In the end, Eileen was convicted of Richard Mallory's murder. About a month later, in March 1992, Eileen pleaded no contest to three more murders, for which she was also found guilty and sentenced to death. In June 1992, Wernos once again pleaded guilty to the murder of Charles Cascadon and was given yet another capital sentence in November. Outside of court, Eileen Eileen admitted to the killing of Siems, but since his body was never found, she did not receive a sentence. Ten years after first being sentenced to death, Eileen Wernos was still on trial and was deteriorating quickly. Even though she was diagnosed as a psychopath with a borderline personality disorder during her test, the court ruled that it was not strictly relevant to her crimes. Still, it did explain the instability that made Eileen start to lose her mind from her prison cell. Over a decade after she knew she was going to die, Eileen was still undergoing trial. At this point, she was already tired of living and just wanted to be done with it. So. What did she do? In 2001, Eileen petitioned to ask the court for her sentence to be hurried along. She listed abusive and inhumane living conditions as the reason. Wernos also claimed that some sonic weapon was attacking her body. Her court-appointed lawyer tried to argue that she was irrational and unhinged, but not only did she refuse to go along with his defense, she also confessed again to the slayings and sent this as a document for the court record. I am so sick of hearing this she's crazy stuff. I've been evaluated so many times. I'm incompetent and sane and trying to tell the truth. I hate human life and would kill again. You have to kill Eileen Morris because she'll kill again. One year later, Eileen Wernos finally got what she wished for. On the 9th of October 2002, she was put to death by lethal injection on the morning of that day.